Okay, so my presentation is on the mangrove forest. Uh, just a brief introduction. Um, over the years, mangroves have attracted a lot of attention from ecologists um, and botanists due to um, their strange adaptations and tolerance ranges. Uh, there's about 80 different species of mangrove trees globally, but we probably won't find all of those in Costa Rica. Um, they are tidally influenced uh, wetlands along the coastal saline margin. Um, salinity is a really, really important factor in the establishment of mangrove forests. Um, unfortunately, they are threatened. There was a study here um, that said about 35% of mangrove forests were lost in the past decade. That's likely to have gone up since 2001. Um, and they grow in anaerobic soils and uh, Laguna Gandoka is the largest mangrove forest in Costa Rica. Um, okay, so they can easily be uh, distinguished by their roots, so if you look here that's quite a, dis a distinguishing feature. Um, there are three different zones, so the first one is the coastal zone and as the name indicates that's the one that is closest to the coast. Um, you find aerial roots on the coastal zone and they've got sort of like very strong roots that stick up out of the ground um, and that's like good for stability. And then we've got the middle zone, so the one that's like a little bit further back and these roots branch down from the middle of the tree so they're less drastic as the aerial roots and they're called prop roots. And then finally the inland zone and they have need roots, so they're completely different from the others. They only stick out just a little bit from the soil. Um, they, the mangrove trees that have these need roots are less tolerant to the salinity because they're furthest away from the coast. Um, yeah, and they're um, less extreme in height because they don't need to be as stable. Um, okay, so Laguna Gandoka, as I said, is the largest mangrove forest in Costa Rica. Um, these are the four most dominant species that are there. So we've got the red mangrove, the black mangrove, the white mangrove, and finally butterwood. Okay, on to adaptations. Um, as I said before, the roots are one of like, the biggest adaptations that the mangroves had. Um, here I've got some uh, examples of aerial roots, prop roots, and finally need roots. And as you can see, these ones are very different to these two. Um, they adapted these roots for stability reasons, so in their soft sediment they need very big roots that come up from the ground to keep them stable. Um, just some examples, the red mangrove on the previous slide has prop roots, so more like this middle picture here, whereas um, black mangroves have sort of shallow widespreading roots, so more like these need roots here. Salt tolerance, as I said before, um, salinity is an important factor in the establishment of mangroves. Um, and they cope with this salinity in um, either of two different ways. So the first one is salt exclusion. And this stops salt from entering the xylem of the roots. Um, and then the other one is salt excretion. So the mangrove uses the salt. Basically it takes it in and secretes the salt by these um, glands in the tissue. So um, it doesn't like get rid of it, it just uses it. Um, red mangrove, that's an example of a salt excluding species and the black and white mangroves are an example of salt excreting species. And finally anaerobic adaptations, so as I said before the sediment is anaerobic so it doesn't have a lot of oxygen in it and they have adapted to these conditions again with these roots. Now as you can see from the picture in the background these roots stick up and in, in like other plant and tree species, their root systems are below ground. So we don't really like see what's going on in the ground because they use the oxygen from the soils. But it, if it grows in anaerobic conditions, then it can't use the oxygen because there's not a lot of it. So it's adapted to have their root systems above ground and uses atmospheric oxygen. Okay, mangrove productivity. Um, the three main things that humans can get from the mangrove forest is timber, charcoal, and plant products. So um, mangrove wood is extremely valuable because it's resistant to rot and it's resistant to insect damage. So a lot of the um, coastal indigenous species use this um, mangrove wood for construction purposes and for fuel as well. Um, these communities also collect plants from the mangrove forest for medicinal purposes. 
um, and they use the mangrove leaves as animal feed. Okay, so the importance of the mangrove forest, Emma touched on this in her presentation. So the main importance is coastal protection. From this picture here, you can see that at the back, that's the mangrove forest, and this is a coral reef. So they grow really, really close together. Um, so what the mangrove forest does is with these dense root systems, um, if sediment is leached off of the land or it's coming from rivers, it traps these sediments and stops them going into the coral reefs. And if the mangrove forest wasn't there, then these sediments would just go straight into the coral reefs, smother them in sediment. And then these xanthalae in the corals are prevented from photosynthesizing, so ultimately the corals die. Um, so by filtering out these sediments, it protects them and also protects the seagrass beds. Um, also, the mangrove forests, as they grow like along the side, and they protect, protect the coastline from erosion from storms and waves. So they're quite important. Okay, fish in the mangrove forest. I've got a study here, um, unfortunately it's from the Netherlands, but this study looked at the transition of fish species from their juvenile state to adulthood and how they used three different habitats, so how they used seagrass beds, coral reefs and mangroves. So they looked, they, it was quite a long study, they looked at the fish when they were juveniles and how they used seagrass beds initially. And then when they got to their more intermediate state, they um, transitioned over to mangroves. And then finally, when they reached adulthood, they moved into the coral reefs. So that was basically like the whole um, conclusion of their study is that um, mangroves and seagrass beds are used as like nursery habitats. However, they noticed that these species up here, the ones listed at the top, kind of preferred the mangroves over any of the others. So then in 2015, they did a follow-up study. And they were looking at maybe it's not actually age that defines where these, where these fish transition. Maybe it's actually body size. So then they did another study and looked at um, sort of the age of the fish and if they were adults and whether they were using the mangroves more than the coral reefs, like in relation to their body size and they concluded that this was actually the driving factor. So when you have a look at the fish that are in the mangroves, they're likely to be smaller bodied than the ones that spend a lot of time in the coral reefs. And then there was another study uh, done in the Mesoamerican Reef in the Caribbean. And this study looked at the importance of mangrove forests. Um, they found some amazing results in their study. Um, it sh they showed that there are about 25 times more fish in coral reefs where mangrove forests are quite rich than in places where the uh, mangrove forest has been cut down. Um, I've got some statistics here that show that actually, yeah, it, um, like their st statistics came out significant and that mangroves do influence the coral reef systems. Um, and then I've got a table here and I thought this was amazing. So I've highlighted here um, one of the most interesting ones. So you've got three different types of reef and then you've got all the, like, the different fish they looked at at the side. And if you look at this one, Ochrysorus, um, its preferred habitat is the, this reef here. And um, so if you look at where mangroves were scarce and then compared to where mangroves are rich, there was a 116% biomass increase where, there, where the mangroves were rich as opposed to where they've been cut down. So I just thought that was amazing, like how much the mangroves can actually influence the abundance of fish. Okay, on to invertebrates. There are loads of different invertebrates that I could talk about. Um, here are just a few examples of the ones that we were probably finding in Costa Rica. Um, I've got a few pictures as well, so you can have a look at them. So you've got the um, mangrove tree crab, a barnacle species, and this is an upside down jellyfish. Um, case study, finally, from Costa Rica. And this, this study looked at the relationship between puffer fish and um, periwinkles, mangrove periwinkles. So it looked at how the predation of pufferfish on these periwinkles 
affected the vertical distribution and migration of periwinkles that lived on the red mangroves. So the study showed that puffers predate on small to medium sized body periwinkles and kind of left the larger ones to be because they can't crush them. Um, I've got a table here, that a um, figure here that shows, shows this trend. It's more apparent in the Elvaria um, species. So as you can see, as the body length increases, the percentage consumed decreases. Um, now, it might not seem ever so important, but actually, it kind of is. Because um, it shows that what they found in their study is that the, um, this predation affects the lower distribution of the periwinkles. So from what I can gather, they'll have like different levels as to like how they hold themselves on the roots. So it's probably like larger bodied ones will be higher up maybe. And then as, as you go down, they kind of get smaller. And um, they concluded that um, the puffer fish are the primary predator um, on these two different periwinkle species. So they have a massive influence um, on the population control. And if their predation is affecting the lower vertical distribution, then that kind of has some maybe negative symbiotic relationship. But there was not enough evidence in the study to prove any of their theories. So um, they'll probably do another study or just leave it at that. Um, so finally, just to conclude, these are the points that I covered. Um, I suppose the, the main points that you can take from this is that mangrove forests are extremely adapted to these specific conditions. Um, they're a very useful resource to humans and animals alike, and they play a vital, vital role in coral reef protection, and they help influence the coral reef systems. Here are my references. Any questions? Thank you. Thirteen. Now, you guys, any Ooh. questions? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned um, the importance of mangroves on invertebrates and fish. Yeah. Are mangroves important for any mammal species in particular? Yeah, I didn't actually go into mammals, but um, as you can see from that picture, that's a sloth. Yeah. And it's using the mangrove forest. <laughs> so um, I, I assume that they do have. Um, obviously a massive importance to them. Again, I didn't look at any specifics, but because they're um, kind of more, it's more of like a marine forest. Yeah. So that's why I looked at the, the fish and the invertebrates a little bit more. But yeah, I'm, I'm guessing they have a huge importance to the mammals as well. Yeah, they're actually um, monkeys living in the mangroves. So same species that we see Um, well, what from that study? Yeah. I have no idea. No. Uh, well, well, I think it might be because they provide maybe a little bit more shelter because yeah. of the roots. Maybe there's like more places to hide. I don't know. And because you get sort of like loads of different species in the coral reef, it's so diverse. Maybe they feel a little bit threatened being there, being so small. Yeah. Is probably what I can, I can get from that. Yeah, I've got a question about that too. Because obviously, the coral reef is a very small fish. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but um, the these these fish that stay there in the mangroves, then um, are these also uh, fish that are consumed by humans or not? Um, I don't know actually. I know that um, mangroves are important for commercial fishing. They are good for like fisheries, but um, I don't know if those specific. So it didn't, say, the, it didn't the, say if they were consumed by humans, no. no. Okay. Um, so why would you think, why, why, I mean, you mentioned some stuff, but why would they really stay there? Um, yeah, so, so why would the fish so stay there um, even as they, what, what is the impact of the mangrove there other than protection maybe? Um, I'm not really sure. Maybe, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I have no idea. Maybe it's, the food that they have? yeah, it could be maybe the, the invertebrates that live there. Maybe that's 
they've got sort of like relationships with those, I have no idea. And again, the only thing that sort of cropped up was protection. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is the difference, or is there a difference in, in the water quality, um, well, I, mangroves to I suppose it'll be like, leaves? in mangroves, it'll be like full of sediment. And it'll be probably a little bit cloudier, which I don't know why that would be more beneficial to fish. Because like obviously, because the, the mangroves stop the sediment going into the coral reefs, the coral reefs are quite clear. But I don't, I don't know why that would be more beneficial to, what I don't do know whether, maybe, at mangroves compared to coral reefs? Um, like I said, uh, they kind of, st like the mangroves stop the waves, don't they? So from where like is the water coming from? What would you think? I'm guessing the water would be calmer in the coral reefs. Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Can you look at the picture behind you? Uh huh. What? This yeah, one? Yeah, the background. <laughs> yeah. Does that look like? But it looks quite still, or? doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Um, yeah. I suppose it probably would be quite still in the mangrove. Okay, I doubt. So that could be maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Another quick question there about the other study with the periwinkles. Yeah. Um, there were no standard arrow bars or anything like that on the graph. Yeah. I don't know. There wasn't. Was there? Oh, okay. <laughs> what What uh, journal was it? Um, let me find it. Um, so that was Duncan, 98, so it's quite an old study. The second one down. Oh, it's not so old. Uh, the stats should be perfect at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was taken directly from the journal. Did you find anything on birds? No. No? Nothing at all. I didn't. Yeah. No, I didn't look at birds at all. Oh, yeah. Okay. Didn't yeah. Look at, yeah. Yeah, I have one question. Um, you talked about the different methods that the mangrove trees use to cope with the salt in their environment, yep. um, the two different methods. Is yep. there any link with what method they use and whereabouts you find them in terms of the um, Well, it said that the red mangrove uses the salt exclusion, uh, so that gets rid of the salt, and the red mangroves are kind of in the more intermediate stage. They're, like in the, they're not right by the reef, but they're kind of in the middle bit. And then the other ones, the black mangrove and the white mangrove used the salt, the other one, <laughs> the salt excretion. Um, and I think they're found further away, but where the, the salt, so I think they're found more inland, but the salinity in the soil is, is less more inland. So I'm guessing that creates a balance for them to, so if like, I don't know if I'm explaining this very well. The red mangroves probably have more salt in their sediment, like in their soils, so they need to get rid of it. Whereas the other mangroves, like the black and the white mangroves, don't have as much, so they use it. Does that make sense? Bring me on to another question. Yeah. You say the red mangroves are in the middly area. I the think. The black and the white are more in inland. Inland, yeah. What's on the coast? What's the one that's... I don't know. Did you come from from uh, the ocean? Yeah. And what is the first mangrove that you did there? I don't know. It might it might be red mangroves. I'm not sure. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. it said that they have prop roots, but when I was looking a little bit more, some of them had aerial roots as well. So I don't know whether it's kind of like a bit of a mix. So I don't know. So, do you think they are under impact of uh, the tides? They're under impact from the tides? Yeah, of the tides. The red mangroves, or just yeah, in, or general, in general, all of them? Yes. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I think so, because they kind of they act like a barrier, don't they? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Is yeah, that, is yeah, that, that's is that <laughs> the answer? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> well, just checking. <laughs> Good. Any more questions? No? Good, thank you. That's it. <laughs>